Hi, I'm Dr. Mark Merriweather Vorderberg, and I teach wild edible plants. Uh, I've been teaching wild edible plants here in Houston professionally since 2008. That's when I was hired by the Houston Arboretum to teach for them. I teach monthly classes down there and then all sorts of other nature centers and parks and private classes and everything all across Texas. I grew up in Minnesota. That's where I learned foraging. My parents were both children of the Great Depression and growing up in their small little towns uh, up in Minnesota, there was no food during the Depression. So the wild edible plants was one of the ways all the families survived. We had the benefit of remaining poor after the Depression, and so we continued to eat wild edible plants. And that's where I learned it, basically, at my parents' side. In 1997, I moved down to Texas, and that's where I started learning all the Texas plants. And the, 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 I'll give you a secret. The key to learning wild edible plants is first identify the plants around you, and then do a Google search and look up to see if they're edible, or look in your books. And you know, once you know the plant, it's a lot easier than trying to go out and find a specific plant out in the wild. My day job, I'm actually a research chemist for big oil, but as I tell people, I'm not evil. In fact, most of what I've been doing for the last 16 years is coming up with environmentally friendly replacements for the toxic oil field chemicals based on my knowledge of plant chemistry. So it works really well meshing that way. That's me in a nutshell. What's your Great. favorite book, Mark? My favorite book, if oh, for new foragers, Samuel Thayer has two excellent books, uh, Nature's Harvest and the or The Forger's Harvest and Nature's Garden. I, I get the titles mixed up. What I like about his books is they have multiple pictures of each plant. He shows a picture of the leaf, a picture of the flower, a picture of the fruit, what it looks like in the spring, what it looks like in the winter. You know, so he really designed the book to identify the plant rather than just one little post, you know, post stamp size picture of the plant. So it, yeah. his two books are excellent. They cover all of North America. Uh, each book, since he goes into so much detail to help you identify it, he only covers about 40 plants in each book, and of the, if you're in Texas, about 35 of those plants are, are readily available around here. This is a cleaver, also known as Velcro weed, and it's an excellent source of vitamin C. You just simply chop it up and make a tea out of it. You can simmer it in a hot water pot and drink the tea. After you've drunk the tea, you can eat the, the weed itself. In the Boy Scouts, we used to use it as fake spaghetti noodles, because you know, it gets fairly long. So we boil it up and then throw the spaghetti sauce and all that on there. Use the long cleavers as, as the noodles. Excellent. Very good sauce. Above us, and my own personal favorite, the Yopon Holly. The reason it's my favorite is because it's the only naturally occurring source of caffeine that grows here in Texas. Uh, it's available any time of the year. The caffeine is in the leaves. You only want to use the leaves. You don't want to use the red berries because the red berries are toxic. They'll make you throw up. But you just take the leaves, let them dry for about two weeks, and that breaks down the cell walls so the caffeine and then the antioxidants and all the other stuff can get out into your water. And away you go. This is American holly. This, again, it's another holly. You can make a tea out of it. It does not have the caffeine in the leaves. Uh, it just has a slight cross between a bitter, a slight bitter, slight wintergreen flavor. It kind of makes a unique flavored tea. And with these leaves, you want to let them dry for a good six weeks because they're so thick and leathery. Again, do not eat berries. Now, this is a common yard wheat that everyone has right now. It's called the crepus, or Japanese hawk's beard. It looks like a dandelion, and it puts up a little stalk with a cluster of little tiny flowers that look like dandelion flowers at the top. It's an edible bitter green, so you treat it like a dandelion. You want to either wilt it in some bacon grease or mix it with a vinaigrette-type sour uh, flavored dressing or just boil it, different ways of, of removing the bitterness. The best way is you want to just dilute it with one part this and nine parts some bland green. I want to point out this one because this one's actually toxic. This is a Jerusalem cherry, and this is in the nightshade family, and it is a toxic plant. You don't want to eat this one. It looks kind of like a chili pequin, which is in the same family, but this is toxic. And, Doc, what's the rule about red? There is no rule about red. Well, the red but, is, if you don't know what it is, what what the plant is just stay away from it mm, no because there, there are edible red berries there. right the, the best bet is just learn the plants around you that is the best <laughs> yeah all oh, through here we have the wood sorrel and this is really tasty it has a nice tangy lemon sort of flavor the wood sorrel and you can eat you know quite a bit of this without any issues so that's not it, clover it's not clover if you look, it has kind of a heart-shaped leaf, whereas the clover has a round leaf. 
Uh, it's, the clover is also edible, and the clover is actually high in protein. This doesn't have any protein in it, but this tastes better. All this is turkey tail mushroom. This is known as a polypore. If you flip it over, instead of gills, it has little tiny pores. That's where the spores come out. And it's called turkey tail because it kind of looks like the tail of a turkey. It has these bands of color that can go blue, it can be brown, it can be green. These white ones are old ones, and these are no longer really useful. But these are good medicinally. They're loaded with anti, uh, uh, antivirals and antibacterials. They make a really good tea. And what I like doing is I'll just cut it off the, off the, the, the wood, chop it up some, and then boil it for about 10 minutes in, in a cup of water, and then drink it. It has a really nice mushroom gravy sort of flavor to it. So it's good that way. You don't really eat these. They're kind of tough and leathery for eating. You, you make teas from them. You can also make an alcohol extract from them and get the medicinal properties out that way. So very tasty. And there's really nothing else that looks like it as far as mushroom goes. You just want them thin. And if you kind of feel it, it has a slight velvety feel, and kind of rubbery. But the bottom has all these pores. And if you kind of look at the pores, you won't be able to see this on the video. But it's almost like a uh, butterfly's wing. The colors, there's kind of a shininess to it. Iridescence. Yeah, that's what I'm looking for. So we have the dewberry. And, of course, in the spring, you know, late May, early June, we'll have the berries. But any time of the year when the leaves are green, you can make a nice, a nice dewberry tea from the leaves. And it's best to let them age for about two weeks to break down the, the cell walls so that the, the nice flavor chemicals can get out into your hot water. Also, the root of the dewberry is used to combat uh, diarrhea. So you'd make a real strong tea from the chopped up root. If the person was suffering from nausea, diarrhea, you give them a tea made from the root of the dewberry, and it will help seal it up. The leaves will help some, but the root is better for that. So I know with poison oak and poison ivy, they have a saying, leaves are three, let it be. And here's leaves are three, so how do you know the difference? Well, for one thing, the dewberry has the thorns on it, and the, the, uh, the poison ivy does not. And it's not all that noticeable, but it, the, on the poison ivy, the two lower leaves, they'll have a thumb sticking out. So they'll have a, you know, a more mitten shape than these. Shut up and smell it. Yeah. It's a, a bay tree here in this oh. area. We have the, the sweet bay, Wonderful. the red bay, and a laurel cherry. The sweet bay and the red bay, you use them just like regular cooking bay. The laurel cherry it smells like bitter almonds that has cyanide in it. You don't use that one for cooking. <laughs> <laughs> So bay, I'm not familiar with bay. They're like an Italian seasoning, really. Okay. Like a... It also is used in a lot of preps to keep out the weevils yep. and such. Yep. Like in weevils. Do not in like wheat. to get into your beans and your wheat and things like that. Your wife might be interested in this one, the cudweed. That's a common yard weed, and a tea made from that helps with congestion and uh, expectorant. This is another common yard weed. This is Carolina geranium, and it's not edible. What it is is the root is a very strong uh, astringent. It's a very good blood stopper. So the Native Americans, they would dig up the root, powder it, and then for not huge gushing, you know, squirting wounds, but your, you know, medium to, to small wounds, they would pack that in there, and it, it causes the capillaries to seal up and stop the bleeding. This here. It's called pony's foot because it looks like the hoof of a pony. And this is just basically the iceberg lettuce of the wild edible plant world. It's a bland green, not a whole lot of flavor, not a whole lot of minerals or anything like that. But it's just a, a good filler, and especially it's good to use as a dilutant for some of the, the bitter greens, like the dandelions and so forth. And this will form big, long, thick mats. Will, you, will the leaves get much bigger than that? Um, a little bigger, not much bigger than that. This is a good size right here, though. And you just heat the leaves. It's actually on runners. If you pull this up, it'll have runners under the ground that connect them all. Just heat the leaves, though, because the runners are kind of tough and stringy. Okay. This is a reishi mushroom. It's actually one of probably the top medicinal mushroom in the world. Hmm. It's a summer mushroom. These are older. There's some over here, too. 
Uh, and again, this is one you make a tea out of. You don't eat it. And you can treat it the same way as with the turkey tail, where you chop it up, extract it in alcohol and water. So it's food filled with anti-tumor agents, antiviral, antibacteria. Uh, it's basically considered the mushroom of long life over in Asia. They grow over here, too. But these are find them in the summer. <laughs> so. so is there a good mushroom book? There's Mushrooms of Texas, which is pretty good. Uh, the problem with it is it only has one picture of each mushroom. What I recommend is uh, combining the Mushrooms of Texas with the Smithsonian Guide to Mushrooms. Uh, the Mushrooms of Texas talks about the, the edible uses and so forth. And the Smithsonian Guide to Mushrooms is really good for identifying the mushrooms. So the two put together is what you need. The needles of the pine trees are loaded with vitamin C. So, but to get it, you take the green needles, and normally you want to find a shorter tree than this, and chop the, the needles up really fine, and then put them in hot water. Don't boil them. If you boil them, you're going to extract all the resins and the sap and stuff, and it's going to taste like pine salt when you drink it. Uh, so just like 160, 140 degrees, too hot to touch, and let it soak for 10 minutes. But uh, two tablespoons and a cup of water, they'll give you all the vitamin C you need for a day. A word of warning. With women, of uh, pregnant women, there is a compound in the pine needles that can cause a miscarriage if they get, you know, a fair amount of it. It actually, you know, like four or five cups a day of it would be enough to cause a miscarriage. So it's warned that women don't use the pine needles as a source of vitamin C. The other interesting thing, though, you know, in the spring when everything covered with the pine pollen, that yellow pine, that is chemically identical to testosterone. In fact, the Native Americans, they would collect it, and then before going into battle, they would they would imbibe it and basically give themselves roid rage before going into battle. <laughs> I really want to do a study to see if the incidences of road rage uh, increase during pine pollen. <laughs> so this is a dwarf palmetto, and what's really neat about this is it's one of the few good sources of calories in the area. If you dig up the root, if you've ever had palm heart, this has an edible palm heart, but it's all underground. Think of it as like a palm tap root. So it takes some effort to dig it up and get it. A one this small isn't worth digging up. You want to find one that's a good five feet across or so. The, the branch is, I guess that's more like six feet, but you know, the bigger the better. Uh, but you dig it up and you just, it'll look like celery wrapped around the tree. You just pull the, the tough outer leaves until you get a one that feels like a potato. And at that point, treat it like a potato. It's a bit more bitter than a potato. I like the flavor. Other people complain that it's it's a little too bitter for them. If you soak it overnight in salt water, that will remove a lot of bitterness. And then at that point, you, I, I like it raw, or you can fry it up, chop it up, fry it up. Um, you can probably make hash browns out of it. I haven't tried that. Really? It doesn't make good french fries, though, because it's yeah. you know, like sheets. But it has a nice tasty flavor, and that those calories are available all year round. Uh, in the fall, it'll put up these stalks, and they'll have these little black berries on them, and the berries are edible, too. And they also contain the chemical in there that the, the saw palmetto does that uh, reduces the swollen prostate. So uh, for that, you, know, you can get that from the berries in this. We got all sorts of food here. We got the turkey tail. We got the American holly. We got assorted mushrooms. This is called an artist conch. And again, this is another medicinal mushroom. Uh, one where you chop it up and use it as tea. You don't eat it. You just make a tea out of it. But again, this is a polypore, and I don't know if you can see, but it has all these tiny little holes in the bottom there. That's the identification of a polypore. There are no toxic polypores. So, you know, you, even if you get one that isn't the artist conch or you know, the formis or one of those, you're not going to poison yourself as long as it has all these little holes in the bottom. So what's your uh, counsel on uh, mushroom harvesting? And Study, study, study. There are some good books on mushrooms out there. The Texas Guide to Mushrooms uh, will tell you the likely mushrooms you're going to find out here. And then the Smithsonian Guide to Mushrooms is excellent for identifying mushrooms. If you're really into it, there is the Falcon Guide to Mushrooms, and it has what's called a key guide to help you identify the mushrooms. So you go through it. Does it have a stem? Turn to page 14. Does it grow as a... You know, right off the tree, turn to page 18, and you work your way through until you identify the mushroom. But that one, you really need to know the scientific terms of the, the mushroom. So the Smithsonian, this is kind of a match. 
they also here at Jesse H. Jones, they do offer mushroom classes. Um, I can't remember when the next one is coming up. And then in my classes, too, I, I talk about the, the easily recognized mushrooms that are good to eat or make medicine from. What's your website, by the way? It's uh, www.foragingtexas.com. Sweetcombs are interesting. In fact, up until about the 1920s, the sap of this was actually used as a flavoring for chewing gum. The, uh, it has kind of a sweet sort of a flavor, chewing gum flavor, but it's better mixed with sugar and other stuff. But it's, it's like chicle and the rubber trees and so forth. It's the one that puts out these pods that are really painful to step on. And before the pods open up, all the seeds are gone from here. But you can bust these open and get the seeds out, and they have kind of a strong, almost clove-like flavor. And you can use it just kind of like cloves to help settle your stomach and things like that. Also, the leaves of the sweet gum, which we don't have any right now, have a natural antibiotic in them. And so it was interesting if you had a bad cut or wound, you would mash up some of the leaves and pack it in the in the wound to prevent the bacterial infections. It's been said that the fruit of this tree, the sweet gum, is also used as a replacement for tammy flu. Hmm. Yeah, actually, yeah. There's uh, one of the compounds. The, uh, right. I can't recall the yeah. compound. Yeah. Yeah. We've got two things here. we got lichen, and this is basically nature's oatmeal. We got the regular lichen. You chop this up, boil it into a goo, and then we got the old man's beard. Uh, there's actually a fair number of calories in the old man's beard, but there's calories in this one, too. If you read your, your history of the Arctic exploration and so forth, a lot of the Eskimos, this is one of the things they eat, scraped off the rocks. You don't have to worry about any toxicity. There's no toxic lichens uh, in this part of North America. There's one on the west coast, but it doesn't come east of the Rockies. You just take it, chop it up, boil it into a goo, and away you go. Now, this is a red bud tree. Now, this is the one in the spring. It's covered with the little purple flowers with no leaves. Those flowers are edible. Wait till they open. When they open, they're nice and sweet. When they're still closed, they're a little bitter. And then after the flowers, they put up these things that look like pea pods. And when these are small and tender, you can use them just like a pea pod and, and stir fry and so forth. And you just saute them up. You can also freeze them and store them for later so you can have pea pods whenever you want. And they produce lots and lots and lots and lots and lots. You can see just how covered this is. Every flower produces a, a pod, or at least every flower you don't eat produces a pod. So there's a lot of food on the red buds, and they look beautiful. It's a beautiful tree. Yep, it makes a really good landscaping tool. Now this is a <laughs> toothache tree, also known as a prickly ash. And its claim to fame is in the bark and in the leaves, there's actually a uh, natural novocaine. So if you have a toothache, you would take some of the bark and just pack it in your mouth and suck on it. And eventually your mouth goes numb, and then your friend can come in with the pliers or the rock or the hammer and yank the tooth out. And uh, you won't feel a thing for another 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> and then but don't swallow it. Don't swallow it. It actually <laughs> tastes pretty lousy. It tastes kind of like the glue on the back of stamps when you just have to lick the, the stamps. If you see the, the thorns are all randomly placed all over it, there's another tree called the Devil's Walking Stick where the thorns form rings around the trunk. That one does not have the Novocaine in it, so you want to make sure you have this one. The, uh, also, the berries, which appear in the late summer, uh, that's the, one of the key ingredients in the Szechuan cooking. Uh, these trees are found all over the world, and the berries, uh, to make the Szechuan sauce, they mix the really hot peppers with the berries of this tree, and then your tongue goes a little numb, and it changes the, the, the heat from the, the hot peppers into the Szechuan seasoning. So it's pretty cool that way. This is a Texas rattan. It's just used in basketry and weaving and caning chairs and all this sort of thing. It's just a vine that tangles up all over the place. So it's not edible, but it's still useful for basketry as its main claim to fame. This is chickweed. This is a common urban yard weed. It's a real good just salad green. You can make a good tea out of it. It's real popular in green smoothies. Some more over here. Uh, its main claim to fame is it adds a nice creaminess to things. And in fact, it's used as an aloe vera replacement also. So if you have a rash or a burn or something, you can mash some of it up and rub it on there. And it's a demulcent. It helps repair the, the mucus uh, membrane and skin. Just coat and soothe. 
So just across here, what do we have? Okay, so we have, here we have the chickweed. Here we have the crepus, the Japanese hopbeard. Uh, here we have henbit, which is another good tea plant and mild medicinal plant. Um, it's awesome. This, I'm not sure, this actually looks like whorehound, but it's a little early yet, so I'm not positive yet. Can't do a positive identification on that. Yeah, oh, this is that Carolina geranium, the, the blood stuffing. What I'm trying to here is show this plant, this purplish plant. And that is called lyre leaf sage, L-Y-R-E, like the musical instrument. And here's some more here. This is the stuff coming up. And this is in the mint family, and it makes just a nice salad green or a cooked green. It forms big patches. As Once you learn to identify it, you'll be driving down the road, and you'll see this kind of violet wave next to the car in the ditch, and you realize that's all wire leaf stage. <laughs>